open up our discussion, I would like to ask Chris Stoltz, uh, again, our homegrown talent, to say a few words about the Australian uh, job market, how it's turned over the last five to ten years and where he sees it going over the next ten years or so. Thank you. Thanks, Eddie, throwing me in the deep end. Um, first of all, uh, thanks for the opportunity to be here and, uh, you know, normally you come to an event and you get told to turn your phones on, uh, off, turn them on if you like, and uh, what, during the evening, uh, tweet. Uh, or uh, what's that other one, Instagram or something, and spread the good news and the good love, and the hashtag is engineer. So uh, I'd ask you to do all that. Um, the engineering or the employment outlook for engineers is really interesting. We've just uh, published a report where we've looked at the job vacancies over the last few years, um, and it's interesting, obviously, anyone who knows where Australia is on the map knows that we've been through a mining boom and that that bust and now it's a little bit tighter than it used to be. But the, the news is good, particularly if you're a civil engineer or a mechanical engineer, because the, the forecast for mechanical and civil engineers is, is quite good. In fact, anecdotally, I've been told by a number of people that if you're an unemployed civil engineer, there must be something wrong with you. Uh, right at the moment, believe it or not, we have $40 billion worth of rail projects, and that includes light rail, signed up, underway, happening and probably as much again in the, in the wind coming down the, down the track. So there's a huge opportunity. A lot of that's, of course, down the eastern coast, eastern seaboard, which is where most of Australia's population is. Um, but it's not just civil engineers and so on that work in those industries. Last year I was at Monash University, the Institute of Rail Technology had a seminar for 150 engineering graduates. Nine employers turned up, they had five minutes each, and if I could paraphrase their message, it was, come and work for us. We don't care what you are, you're an engineer, you're electrical, electronic, you're civil, you're signals, you're systems, we don't care, we need you. And they were the companies like Downer, John Holland, Siemens, these were all the major companies that are at Bombardier, these are companies that are involved in the rail projects in Australia. So it, it's, it's an opportunity, it's happening now, and for the young engineers, and that's most of you here, we're all young, um, there are employment opportunities there. Um, so, so my view about jobs for the future is um, you can be pessimistic and you can say, woe is me, and you can blame that, particularly if you're an overseas qualified engineer, you can say, I keep getting rejected because I don't have local knowledge or I don't have this or I don't have that. Um, and I understand that and I get it. But I would say to you, if you've applied for 250 jobs and you've only got one interview, change tack. There's something wrong with your approach. And I counsel people, obviously because I'm from Engineers Australia, to come to our events, network, mingle, uh, start talking with people, get new ideas, exchange business cards, because that's the way you'll meet people and find job opportunities. It's generally held in Australia that 70 or 80 per cent of jobs are filled before they're advertised or, or they're not advertised. So don't wait round for SEEK. Don't give up on SEEK, but don't wait round. Get out there and have a go. Thank you so much, Chris. I'll go to uh, Barry Shoup and uh, ask him a question. Barry, uh, given that you teach disruptive innovation courses, where do you see uh, innovation disrupting uh, current job markets and where is the future heading? I don't think that was one of the questions that I was given, but okay, we'll, we'll go with that. Um, so, disruptive innovations are something that um, you don't always see coming, and it's not necessarily something that's brand new. It's something, in a lot of cases, that is, in fact, um, reused, if you will, in a different context. Uh, we met with Clayton Christensen at Harvard Business School a number of years ago, and he talked about the electric car being a disruptive innovation. But when you look at the electric vehicle or the electric car, all of the components of it have already been around. What I would say in terms of, of innovation, particularly disruptive innovation, um, from a job market perspective, is, is innovation fundamentally requires diversity. And it requires diversity of perspective and diversity of background. And so one of the things that I would say in terms of future jobs is be careful not to become very narrowly specialized in a specific area. 
Um, my distinguished colleague to my left, your right, talked about some of the future direction committee kind of programs that are coming out. IEEE is very good having societies that are very deep technically in a specific area. But when you look at the future direction projects that are coming out, things like big data, things like cybersecurity, things like um, uh, smart cities, those are all truly interdisciplinary kinds of, of activities. And so what I would encourage in terms of disrupting the future, in terms of jobs, is I would encourage young people to not become narrowly focused, but in fact, think a little bit more broadly about what you are doing. Spend some time um, researching, maybe changing jobs periodically, maybe as an electrical engineer becoming a civil engineer in Australia for a couple of years to get some breadth in terms of what you're doing. Because I think for the future, I think that's important. The other thing that I would say is, in terms of diversity, there's a, there's a concept that, that's going around the community that's called the T-shaped individual. So the T-shaped individual is about breadth of information across the top of the T and depth in terms of a specific technical area. That breadth has not just technical breadth, but it has um, what, we, what we traditionally call soft skills. So being able to communicate, to be able to write, to be able to lead um, interdisciplinary teams, um, understanding things like philosophy, under th understanding human, the human dimension of what's going on. So that is what is going to um, move you forward in terms of the future, my, my perception in terms of jobs of the future. Absolutely, thank you thank so you. much, Barry. I might just go over to Karen and, and, and ask, you know, given that young people are so focused on the technical skills as we can always determine that, how important is the emotional intelligence development and the leadership skills that, it, that come along with the profession? I've hired a lot of people in my career and that human aspect, that emotional aspect was equally as important to me as their technical skills. Because when I would assemble a team of engineers, I would want them to be able to respect each other, to communicate, to know how to negotiate. And so these are the things that would come out when I would, would, when I would meet people. Um, I'll, I'll tell you, I love to tell stories. I interviewed a guy once and he said, I asked him, why are you leaving your current company? And he said, because my manager is a jerk. I can't stand bosses. They're a bunch of idiots. He went on and on. His, his emotional maturity level was way down here because, of course, in my head, I thought, well, you're never going to say that about me because I'm never going to hire you. <laughs> um, but as we move towards the idea of ethics in technology and technology for humanity, understanding that human dimension, I think, is, is extremely important. That doesn't mean you have to be an extrovert, but it does mean you need to be able to understand that there's more to what you do than designing a circuit or, or building a, a building. Absolutely. Uh, Mukesh, cloud computing, machine learning, we're heading into a world where there is a large threat that many of the jobs that we have today are going to be automated. Given that we just mentioned uh, the emotional intelligence, the importance in that, the human element in design, where do you see the future with cloud computing and machine learning and how do humans stay ahead of the computer in many okay. ways? Okay, so I think you have two questions. You said about the automation and job losses, which I firmly believe actually uh, is not like that. If you go back four decades back when the computers came, at least particularly in India, there was a lot of opposition that we should not bring computers in India, then there will be a lot of jobs will go away and so on. And what happened? It happened the other way. It created millions of jobs. And not only the jobs within the India, but we really exported our people to all over the world. Right? So that's one thing. Right? And, and what happens basically that when there is an automation, the new inventions do come from the smart people sitting in this room, right? which basically creates more and more jobs. Right? And today what is happening actually, whether it's a machine learning or AI or deep learning, NN or whatever, is basically that the app people are going to pay for the applications. What basically sits behind uh, the application, 
right? They are not going to worry about that. And this is one of the reasons that big companies are really struggling when they were selling machines, software, services, maintenance, and so on. So, and everything is moving on the cloud, right? So now basically you do anything, you get the service from the cloud, but that also has its own limitations because there are certain kind of data that you cannot bring it on the cloud because of the privacy and you know security issues. And if something happens in the marketplace, if one or two cases happens, then people really get worried and then they say, hey, we would like to have actually on-prem the things right there. Yes, machine learning, the AI and the new things, they are really changing the way we think, right? Uh, the way basically we work, that is the old way. The, if you think basically me and my son, actually there is a big difference than what it was me and my father, right? So I think the machine learning, AI, they are playing a very uh, big role in doing the things, right? And uh, making the things more smarter, learning actually from the prior experience and how to feed back this whole loop and do better and better from, from that. And, and getting everything on the cloud, providing that as a service is the key to, to reduce the cost, as well as therefore basically the better services and faster services. Okay, thank you so much. I'll touch it down, uh, convergence of technologies. In the, the past probably 10 years we've seen organizations like the IEEE look at emerging technologies and bring together many technical fields under one umbrella to solve some of the major problems. In fact, everything that we do in day-to-day -day life is interdisciplinary in nature. So, given the interdisciplinary nature of some of the problems that we're trying to solve, where do you see further convergences of technologies and professionals? For example, Chris comes from civil engineering background. And, uh, many people in civil engineering don't view technology as something that's disrupting their profession as fast as it is in many others. So, where are you seeing the emerging convergence occurring? Um, I think it's uh, a combination of convergence, but also of uh, consolidation and commoditization. Um, so we've been working very and I specifically on the intersection of uh, cybersecurity and then deep learning. Um, and you can go so far in cybersecurity, you can go so far in machine learning, but only if you go in that intersection uh, do you get deep into the problems. Uh, and once you get there, then it won't be some feature full solution. Uh, initially, you, you will do that. As a matter of fact, I'll refer to what Barry said about uh, Christian Anderson, uh, where, where, where these S curves exist, where you start uh, with very commodity solution, uh, you get in the market, and then you go up and add features and features until someone else comes underneath you. Um, and for all these things, I think you really need to be interdisciplinary. Um, and, and, and that's inevitable in almost any area. Uh, today, for example, the chips uh, are reaching their limits. They are reaching their limits in terms of um, computational power, uh, in, in terms of uh, how much um, power they actually use. And there are new technologies that are coming, um, quantum computing, uh, neuromorphic, et cetera, et cetera. For each of these, one needs to be really interdisciplinary because the, everything is open now. You know, it's the technology how you develop, it is the uh, system software that you have to write, it is the applications, and then you only touch in a small area. So for example, today it's the convolutional neural networks that you can implement. It's not anything. So you really have to be focused, you need to have this interdisciplinary, entrepreneurial, uh, something in yourself in order to, to deliver solution. But, but I agree with everything that was said, like what you said about application, it's all application driven. Absolutely. John, I might give you a comment on uh, the IT industry in Australia, how it's changed over the last 30 years since you've been in the profession, and does Australia follow global trends and are we responding rapidly enough to some of the latest developments? Uh, th thanks, yeah, look, and probably as, a, as someone, I'd just like to pass a reflection that someone that studied mechanical engineering and mining 30 odd years ago, um, you know, I had a pretty uh, dinosaur moment when I actually saw what manufacturing was like in this country and then moved into IT. So I could see that innovation and innovation created in this country could be exported easily to anywhere in the world. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that Australia excels at is innovation based on our diversity. And we're very, very good. And I looked at the IEEE slides tonight and I actually just looked at the biggest problems my, 
my business is facing because of our customers. Like, if, if I could employ 20 engineers tomorrow in big data cyber security, um, my sales team would be overjoyed. We, we are running a very large program of recruiting at the moment in this particular area because the customer demand is exploding. Now, two years ago, we didn't even see this as a problem. And, and today, most of, a, a large part of my business is working for Australia's largest telco. And we're working with them building a cyber security as a platform. And we're collaborating with Hortonworks out of the US. And we're using a use case here in Australia. And we're actually helping them develop that software. And so, because Hortonworks knew that their product for a new paradigm, because cyber security is not about building a fence anymore, it's a probability function. And they knew that they didn't have the use case uh, with sufficient volume to be able to do that. And then, you know, I could have also commented that manufacturing hardware is a dinosaur industry in Australia and has very little to do. But I met someone who has a startup in prototype uh, hardware manufacture and it makes a hell of a lot of sense that someone would want to make 10 or 15 new things for this country. So the, the IT industry in Australia is about innovation. It has been for 30 years. There are some very, very strange things. My business partner is a smart Cambridge mathematician and the algorithms he wrote 30 odd years ago for Tabcorp for calculating the wagering odds on horse races in Victoria are still the algorithms used today. And those algorithms actually limit the number of horses that can run in the Melbourne Cup as at today. And the software and the algorithms he wrote all that time ago on some very, very basic you know, infrastructure are still running today. They've been expanded and re revitalised. So you can say, well, what's, what does the IT industry tell you? Well, it's archaic, it's innovative, it's dynamic. Um, diversity is the critical thing. And for anyone here that says, gee, I, I see my job in the future coming to a rapid end because, you know, everything's going to the cloud, I would say, well, you probably do need to move. You know, when we look for people, you know, I, I like the emotional quotient. We actually don't employ anyone based on their skills. We actually look for three things in people. Um, integrity, because if you can't trust someone internally to work in a team, you can't trust them with your customers. Passion, if you've got passion, you can drive to learn new things. And, if you, and you can do that only if you've got a sound intellect. So if you're smart, passionate about what you do, and have a high integrity, there's no role that's outside your bounds. So I'd say the future of IT is in great hands if you've got those three things. Um, my fluids professor um, advised me at university, he said, for God's sake, when you go out and look for a job, don't chase money. Don't chase a particular niche technology but treat your career like a diamond and polish each facet as you go along. Learn something new, polish it, search for excellence in what you do, become excellent, it will be obvious to everyone around you, and once you've polished that facet enough, move to the next. And so throughout my career, I've tried to learn different things, and eventually when I was sort of master of nothing, I became a managing director, but all the way through, you, you start learning different aspects of engineering. So perhaps I answered your question, or perhaps I didn't. Yeah. <laughs> very, very good answer, very comprehensive. Thank you so much. I'll go to uh, Tim Jeffries now. Um, your experience in AT&T, large corporate organisation. You saw a lot of change over the years in AT&T. And what I want to touch on now is not so much the technical focus, but it's the flexibility in employment in young people. And I also touched on this question in a young professional panel that I ran a few days ago in Sydney. And that is young, young people work in different ways. They prefer to have more flexible lifestyles. It's a very, very busy schedule and it's impacted by many things including a social life that isn't necessarily a face-to-face -face social. It includes this digital social world that many of the senior people still are not getting their heads around. So given the nature of, of where young people are sitting today, what sort of flexibility can we expect to see in the workplace and do we need to have a centralised workplace? Can people work from home. Is that the future of work? Will people stay at home and work from home? What is the purpose of going into a workplace from your point of view? So the purpose of going into a workplace, uh, in fact we, we faced this question a, a number of, of times in cycles when I was at AT&T. Let's say work from home, is this a thing that we can do? Do we have the technology to do that? And there are, I think there's always going to be a mix uh, of the work from home opportunity and the work together opportunity. 
Uh, one question I always ask when people would bring me that, and I had that a number of times, uh, so exactly what is it that you're doing right now that requires that you don't need to sit together to collaborate right now? And there are many jobs like that. Uh, or collaboration tools are going to get a lot better. Your ability to work with someone who may not be in your city, may not be in your country, but he's still your partner on the project. So I think a, a number of things. I think there will always be a place uh, for teams working together uh, in rapid development and prototyping operations. There will be a place for uh, remote working, and there will be a place for very remote working enabled by excellent tools. As those tools get better and better, the opportunities for that are going to happen. So I think there's always going to be a, a mix amongst that. Um, in terms of, of careers, it's about having the fundamental skills yourself that make you able to work in any one of those environments. And that is if you can communicate well, if you've got the ability to be comfortable as a team member, uh, if you've got the ability to, um, to share information rather than keep information. So if you've got those kinds of foundations, you'll be able to function well in any one of those. So the fundamentals are going to be the most important. And I think there'll always be a mix of things uh, in that profile. Thanks so much, Jim. Now, I'm just going to make a comment regarding questions. Uh, I will give you a moment to think about some questions that you want to ask. And I will pause the panel after my next question and come back to the audience for a bit of discussion, then we'll return back to the original program. But I want to go back to Mukesh uh, one more time and ask about cybersecurity. So we heard about cybersecurity in a few of the answers. And uh, many comments that we've heard, especially from young people, is, you know, what do you actually need to be a cybersecurity expert? Given all of these online courses that are being offered by universities as well as institutions like IEEE, the Engineers Australia, IET, how easy is it to get into cybersecurity and is there a large enough market in the cybersecurity space for people to do this remotely and be involved? Will that be part of the larger workforce in the future given how many threats exist? I think John made a, was it John that made a very good comment about, you know, it's no longer, um, a, 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 it's, a, well, it's a probability function, right? Whether it happens or not. So comment please. Okay. Yeah, this is a very good question. See the cybersecurity, sorry, the cybersecurity has many facets. Right? The security, whether it's a network level, it's the data level, at the browser level, right? it has many facets. So I, my background is the information management data, so let me talk only focus on the, on the data part rather than network uh, on that. So if you look at in any big organization, you have if not tens, hundreds of database uh, or content repositories and each of them are in silos, each of them has some confidential information and then the question here is basically when, when you are bringing the information from one data source to another data source and over the network, then how you can prevent the information leakage on that, right? So it's a huge area because the more important in the cyber security is that there is no single solution that you can go and open the box and then it starts working on day one, right? It is really based on several, your data infrastructure, your network is, uh, infrastructure, right? And what are the huge cases? Who are the parties basically you are providing the information? How sensitive the information is? So you have to classify and consider this every facets on that. So it's a huge area not only from a technology point of view, you have to look at from a policy, from the legal perspective also, right? So it brings multi-dimensional, as Karen was saying actually that it's not only basically discuss about the technology and, 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 and my co-panelists were also saying that, and very good example I really liked about the diamond example, that when you go basically, you learn from different facets, from different discipline, and you really merge about that, and that is what is all about the cybersecurity age. Right, thank you, Mukesh. I'll go to the audience now just to see if anyone has a question in between our panel discussion. So if anyone has a question, please put your hand up. We have a question here. If I might borrow your microphone. We've got one there. Oh, we've got one there, yep. Uh, thank you, panel, for the excellent insight. Uh, and very satisfied. I'm Gora Gora Data. I'm the chair of the IEEE Orange County section way back in California. Uh, the question I have for all of you is uh, one thing which we are seeing because of uh, advances in technology and some of the aspects which uh, Mukesh spoke about, uh, what we are seeing is the skill gap which exists today in terms of where the technology has taken the knowledge and versus the young graduates who are now coming in. 
And the challenge which we are seeing, at least in California for sure, is the teachers who are teaching do not have the knowledge because the, the technology innovation has taken place in the last 10 years because most of the teachers have been teaching for the last 20 to 30 years, very senior ex experienced teachers, but they don't have the techn technical knowledge or technological knowledge. So what can IEEE do to mitigate this? So who wants to take that one? IEEE or other organizations in, for that matter? I think what it's an excellent question. Let me tell you, if I take the, you know, same analogy with the medical. I mean, here in Australia, what I've heard actually that there is a compulsory attendance for every practitioner or surgeon to attend the seminar every week or two weeks, basically, to upgrade the skills. And this is, I mean, I'm, I'm very new to Australia, just a year old, but I can see basically in, in India, this is a very big problem. And the biggest thing is that teachers really do not want to change. They want to use the same sort of notes what they used to use 20 years back. And I think IEEE can play a major role here. And let's basically see what they can. Does anyone else want to offer a comment on that one? Yeah. Um, I think it depends whether you're a glass half full or glass half empty person. Um, the teachers are not the only source of information. We have uh, so many other ways how students can learn. They can learn from online courses. They can uh, read the documents. They just go to the web. Uh, on the web, the information isn't vetted. That's why uh, there's still a lot of opportunity for IEEE, because we have this tremendous network of experts who vet information and everything that is published in IEEE. Uh, but but there are so unlimited options, and, and I, you can see I'm glass half full person. Uh, so uh, learn from the the old teachers who are very capable, traditional things. But you're responsible for your own education, uh, no matter where you study, and you have to go reach out and get information. I triple is full of, of unlimited opportunities. Chris, you wanted to offer a comment? Was that? Um, I think that uh, the challenge here in Australia is um, uh, is dire in a sense. I mentioned earlier about the number of students that are studying science, technology, engineering and maths in our school system here. Uh, we're devastated by it because Engineers Australia over a number of years have been undertaking a lot of initiatives to try and encourage more kids to study these subjects so that they can move into engineering. And, and I, I, I understand your comment about teachers, how can, how can teachers who haven't been an engineer, for example, get kids excited about engineering? And, and that's, that's um, uh, quite a challenge. Um, we, we, we are tackling this at a number of levels. The problem, there's, there's a number of issues. Let me just quickly take a minute or two. Um, everybody knows what an accountant does. Everybody knows what a policeman does. Everybody knows what a doctor does, because they, they come across them. You even hear people say, my specialist, or my doctor, or my accountant. But how many of you have heard people say, my engineer? You know, it's not a, a relationship normal people have. And, and so, uh, for Australia, and, and, and I know it's not worldwide, but it might be true in America too, um, we don't have good role models for engineers. And engineering, unfortunately, is, is not held in as high esteem as it should be. If you're in Germany, as our friend Peter Moore will tell us here, engineers are thought better of, of, of be, better than uh, lawyers. Any lawyers? That's good. Um, so, so I think that you know, as a profession, we've got to look at a number of opportunities to how do we raise the, um, the, the understanding in the community that the sewerage every time they flush the toilet is there provided by engineers. Telco, unseen uh, most of the time, provided by engineers. When they turn the tap on for water, you know, all of these things have been engineered, but they've got no idea. And, and it's, a, it's a challenge. Um, while I've got the floor, there's one thing. Uh, we talk about things that come out of left field. In politics, this week, who would have thought that so many politicians were dual citizens? Right? It's creating havoc in our parliament. And I think that as engineers, that's going to happen to us. It's certainly going to happen to those of you who are young engineers. There's going to be technologies we haven't even thought of that are going to come out of left field and they're going to disrupt your life. And so just as it's happening in politics, it's going to happen in engineering. Thanks so much. I think Jim also. Sorry, John, did you want to offer a comment? Or? Yeah, look, I, I'd just like to offer a comment because 
getting back to my fluids professor who's probably already gone to God, um, you're accountable for your own education and your own development and I think it's really what are the resources. When I did my seven years of studying engineering because I loved it, um, the thing that I learned is how to go and find a library and there was no World Wide Web then. It's a hell of a lot easier now. And the thing is that you're accountable for your own development. No one can help you. If you don't have that drive and that passion, you will become ancient. You'll be the printer of the future. Um, so I think it's, it's self-accountability. <laughs> well, you, yeah, yeah, 3D printer will actually make China irrelevant, but that's another story. Um, <laughs> but, but I really think that um, you, you're being accountable for yourself gives you the opportunity to the future, the keys to the future. Thank you, John. Jim? Yeah, just thinking that as you, you think about how education might change, and I'm not an academic, but, but the, the very idea that uh, where is the new knowledge being created? And it may not be created in the syllabus of the professors. It might be created in the groups that we had on the charts er earlier this evening. And when you've got a new group, a new community that wasn't there before, they're creating the new knowledge. And it's available to anybody. I mean, you know, in a lot of classes, the notes are handed out ahead of time. Do you have to go to class to get most of that? Question mark. Uh, so there's, there's uh, maybe a whole thinking. It's not just about educating the professors in a different way, but the whole education system might be more flexible as more information becomes available and is created in these, these, new, these new communities and new groups. That's where valuable information will be created. And some of the most important things may be things like the capstone project at the end of an of a, of a, of a education. You know, that's a permanent skill. It isn't related to a technology or the syllabus. It's spot on. In fact, uh, re most recently, we had some comments about how quickly universities or educational institutions can adapt to new knowledge being developed when some of these companies in Silicon Valley and around the world now are developing things at such a pace that universities are really struggling to keep up unless they're directly embedded in some of that work that's being developed. But a really good example here in Australia, a recent uh, company launch, a company called Cloud Guru, a uh, small little startup here in, in Melbourne, Australia, that is now raising millions of dollars for short, fast-paced courses on AWS, so Amazon Web Services and they are taking the world by storm because they're offering something that the market, the universities cannot keep up with. Amazon is making changes on a weekly, on a daily basis and university professors are embedded in that industry are still not being able to actually create the content to teach the students. So that raises the question of future of universities as well as the future of work which will open up a whole other can of worms. I don't want to dive into that one right now but very interesting point that you've made there. I want to ask Karen a question that is something that, going back to what Chris mentioned uh, the engineering profession as a whole, and the recognition of our profession around the world. And the IEEE has uh, you know, public visibility initiatives, and part of the job that we do is really help people understand not only what the IEEE does, what other professional organisations do, but to get more recognition for our profession and the importance of what we do in everyday life. So a comment on that one, where's IEEE? As engineers, we are terrible at marketing ourselves and advertising ourselves. So we have a public visibility committee, but I think they could do so much more. We tend to advertise to ourselves and talk about how great we are within our own organizations because it might be scary to step outside. I used to say that if we had a television show about engineers saving the world and engineers would, you know, this would be really great. And so people say, but Karen, we have this show. It's called The Big Bang Theory. <laughs> I hate that show. I really, really hate that show. That shows social, socially awkward, misfit people that you laugh at. That's not the way we should be advertising our profession. <laughs> So I think what we can do are several things. One of them is, in your everyday life, tell people about what you do. So when I see people that say, well, what do you do? I'm an engineer, well, what does that mean? And I'll say, have you heard of the term Wi-Fi? Oh, yeah. Well, that's a standard for my IEEE, the organization that I represent. Immediately, there's some respect and some interest. I think we talk about mentoring and setting examples and going to the elementary schools, the, the younger students. And it struck me this morning that to send more mature people to the grade schools, the younger children, and say, you should be an engineer, isn't very effective because they're going to look and say, well, you're an old person and I don't know what you're talking about. So if we have the young 
college students going back to their high schools a year or two later and saying, I'm in engineering and it's really cool and I love the stuff that I'm doing. And then have the high school students go to the smaller children and say, this is a really neat thing to do. I think we can better market ourselves by just speaking about it at every opportunity that we possibly can. And, and tell people Big Bang Theory is terrible. No, don't do that. <laughs> That's a very popular show I shouldn't criticize. <laughs> So in a nutshell, everyone has the responsibility of promoting our profession uh, in this city, in Australia, and worldwide. I'll go to Barry and I'll ask a question regarding uh, the military, defence in general. The telecommunications industry has often seen breakthroughs in that particular sector, so the military has led a lot of that initiative. Can we predict the future by looking to um, organisations like the military, the Navy, and other organisations that are really keeping a lot of that innovation in-house and at some point eventually it reaches the public. Have, have you seen any of those trends over the years and can we predict something in the near future? So you asked that question of a military guy, right? <laughs> <laughs> so um, I, think, I think you can still look to the military and, and I, I think the reason that you look to the military for these advances is because the kinds of problems that the military face and the environment that they work in um, present some basically wicked problems. I mean, when you're trying to communicate in a very austere environment, or you're trying to communicate, um, or, or you're trying to detect systems or devices in an austere environment where you have an awful lot of background noise. So, so the military is one area, I think, that you can look to. But I would say organizations like NASA in the United States, where you're doing you know, very, very distant communications, again, in austere environment. Um, organizations like DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency in the United States, are looking out 10, 15, 20 years at what the, kind, what, what the environments are, and they are bringing to the table these grand challenges. And the grand challenges are very specific to, in, in many cases, the military be they Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines. But the kinds of environments, the, the kinds of, of spin-off technologies that come from those grand challenges feed much more than the military, and they actually feed the commercial sector as well as others. So I, I personally think, probably because I come from the military and I'm still in the military, I still think that there's, there's a lot of, um, of advances and innovation going on um, that, that are needed in the military that in fact drive innovation throughout the world. So thank you, Barry. Uh, I might get you guys to all think about it for a second, but Barry touched on grand challenges. So looking at your particular profession, your industry, your experience, what is the main grand challenge that you foresee uh, for humanity as a whole? But of course, engineers will be at the heart of solving some of these major challenges. And I'll come back to you shortly and we'll run through the whole panel. I'll just go back to the audience if anyone has a question for the panel, I see one and two over there. So can we start with the question over here? Yep. Uh, Robert Ralph is my name as a risk engineer. And, and, but my question is really about the software developments and what's going on and the value added program part of it as opposed to its geographical location. Um, could you give some comments about global developments and how it's then going to be isolated to particular positions or geographical places as far as its value adding is concerned. Okay, who wants to answer that question? Yeah? So, um, for the last 15 years I've been working with the teams across the world. Uh, I worked with, uh, at the same time, with teams in India, Brazil, China, Puerto Rico, uh, on, we developed the same software. Uh, and the same is true even now. So the most recent project, I worked with a team in Israel, uh, Switzerland, Cambridge, UK, and US. Uh, I think it's inevitably distributed and global. Uh, it's important that people get together, that they know each other, uh, but once it's done, you know, it's, it's easy for them to work remotely. So I don't think geography is as important uh, although at certain times when it's critical you bring people together. So we brought, for example, the, the professor from Israel to work closely with us. So that's, that takes care of geographical aspect. 
in terms of software development, as I said earlier, I think there's a lot of commoditization and consolidation. So if you look, for example, going bottoms up uh, from the operating systems, um, there used to be many. Uh, as of recently, there were only Linux and Windows. And, and, and both of them are becoming less relevant other than in some extreme situations. As you were pointing out, you want to see the application and not what's behind. The same is true for the middleware stack. Um, we used to have, for those older people, you remember Corba and, and many others, Java, RMI, et cetera. Now it's, it's coming back to the, the few uh, software stacks, uh, one or two, that, that, that are common web services. Um, so I think it's, it's largely consolidation. And the same is true if you go up uh, in terms of packages. So people are used to, you know, to do everything automatically with the phone. It just gets downloaded, automated testing, and everything. So that's, I think, the general direction. I'm not sure if I entirely answer your question. But. Yeah, so I was coming from the more commercial side of it, but how does it, the value adding get associated to which country or where it's actually coming from? Uh, I think. I think you need to address the the certain needs, but you know, phone, for example, which is driving things now. Uh, in the future, it might be IoT. I, I think it's neutral uh, with respect to location. Although there are certain specifics, uh, like in India, they do a lot of currency exchange using phones, which isn't true in in United States. In many ways, we're behind because we don't need. We're stuck with the older technology. So these are some examples. Okay. I think there was one more question behind. Yep, a little question there. Thank you. And then we'll come back to the gentleman in front here. Yeah. Hi, my name is Ariba. I have a general question for the panel. You made a comment tonight about how, as young professionals, we need to be a rather than specialized, that we want to broaden and think more interdisciplinary. So my question is, what skills or knowledge do you need to develop in your current role that will allow you to transition into a completely different industry? Because that's often a challenge because, um, say for example, you're applying for a role that often would want X many years of experience, but if you're working in a completely different industry, um, how do you make yourself applicable for to be able to transition? Okay, very good question. I think we've got a few people Heavily qualified to answer this question, that have transitioned from one industry to another. So, so I think um, I don't know Barry said or, or who said actually about the T shaped. I completely agree on that. Right? Even if I'm doing PhD, it's not only basically as he said, just not to be very narrow, optimizing whatever the algorithm that you are developing. Just go, 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 and you don't know anything surroundings on that. Right? So that is very important that develop the skills in a T shape in any organization. I completely agree basically what Chris said about the networking. And this is the opportunity here, like here, that we have so many of us are here from the industry, exchange your cards, right? See basically what they are doing, develop them, and keep continuing maintaining those relationships. It's not like just, uh, you know, exchange the card and then you forget it. At least send, you know, once in a while, greetings kind of email, meet someone, coffee and this and that, right? So that's very important actually to move from one industry to another industry. The jobs are always, I mean, again, I may be completely wrong, right? The first job are you need the whatever you have learned the knowledge though he said actually the three things actually but i will also add the knowledge other than the integrity and and all that things right but subsequently in the third and fourth or fifth jobs basically is more about your exposure in that industry or in that area in the t-shape and the networking right the, i think these are the really two critical skills that one should have it as you become more senior and senior chris you wanted to offer a comment on that one I think the good old days are gone and um, you know anyone who's coming out of university now that expects to stay in a job for 20 or 30 years I, th I think it might happen but it's going to be pretty rare so uh, if you look at La Trobe University um, they have now created a generalist engineering degree it's recognition of what industry is looking for industry is starting to not really care about what your speciality is uh, it goes back to can you think can you work with people? Are you flexible? Are you innovative? Are you creative? Uh, they're the sorts of things. In my case, 
Um, I have a PhD working for me in nanotechnology. Uh, when he graduated, there was only about three jobs in the world for a nanotechnologist, and he was unemployed for nine months before he bumped into me. And now, he probably knows more about NBN infrastructure than anybody else. He's a, I call him a rocket scientist in that sense. So I think that, and what he's got, he's got this incredible thirst for understanding things. He just loves drilling into detail. He loves dealing with people with ideas. And I know not everybody can be as good or as bad as he is, depending on the scale. Um, but I think that's what we've got to instill in our graduates. You've got to come out, don't expect security. And for God's sake, don't expect to get a job because you deserve one. You've got to go out and sell yourself that you can add value. At the end of the day, what's an employer? It doesn't matter if it's a university or, a, or, or our friend here uh, in private enterprise. They want to make sure they're getting value. You've got to be able to offer something that, that is, is worth something. And that's, I think you've got to have that drive to recognise that. You don't deserve a job, you have to earn it. John, did you want to also offer a comment? You, you were talking about the sort of skills that we're looking for and, and uh, Chris just made a very good mention that generic skills are the ones that you can really hone in on and they're the ones that are transferable from one industry to another. So the problem solving ability to think creatively. So you said you don't look for the super technical skills in individuals. So what is it that you look for? What can these young people take yeah, away from today? Look, it, it is interesting and, and important as choosing your next role is choosing your next employer, right? Um, and I look at one of our most technical network specialists, used to be the percussionist at Melbourne Symphony Orchestra. Didn't study engineering at all, but had a great mind for mathematics, although it was transposed to music. And we trained him up because he was such a, a, an interesting human being and has become a fabric of our company. So I think the, the, the really interesting thing is, when you go and interview for someone, you've got a, you've got a history. And, Honestly, we're, look, we're currently looking for about 20 cyber security people at the moment. So we've got a, I, I know my team has got a, this many CVs to wade through. It's almost impossible to read through a pile of CVs to actually see who there is. So there's, you've got to make sure that that addresses a particular aspect of the role. And then when you get there, convince the people that not only is it the skills you've got in the past, but it's your, your ability to learn new things and adapt very quickly. You need to understand the strategy. If you're going into a business, you know, look at their website and try and work out what their strategy is. Align yourself with the business strategy and say, yes, I've got this, this is what I meant in the past, I can understand this is what you're trying to do and this is how I can help you achieve that. If you can convey that to anyone in an interview situation, you've got a better than 50% chance of getting a job. And, and to be honest, as an engineer in this country, and you know, I'm a proud engineer, the opportunities are almost limitless. You know, I've worked this business that I now own half of, I've been in for 13 years, um, it's, it does the back end of Telstra's mobile phone network. We built Optus's big data cloud platform. We're building cyber security things, none of which I had any experience in or anyone in my organization had any experience in a few years ago. Um, you know, we wrote the signaling stack for Telstra before the standards exist. So you know, in, there was a protocol called SS7 you couldn't buy one off the shelf, we wrote it. Now there's thousands of them, right? We don't bother writing one anymore, we buy one, right? We put the value-added services on top. And to touch on the question that was asked before about value-added services and how do we create value in this country, my organisation stays away from commodity things, right? If you can buy it cheaper somewhere else, you always should. But if it's critical to the differentiation of your business or we have a critical understanding of the local nuances of a particular industry, it's much better done here and we partner with other organizations around the world. There's a very large fruit phone company out of California that we're working with right now to build the world's first entitlement service for a particular application. I can't talk to it, otherwise someone will shoot me. But um, there, there is a, and that's being done in Australia by Australian engineers. Um, the people from California were just amazed at how quickly we could prototype and build things because we're used to doing those sort of things here. And, and so, and that particular software development is now attracting significant investment interest from other organisations because they can see a global application for the thing we've built. So um, to answer the first thing about value added, I think you know, ha your local knowledge gives you a, a leg up, but understand where you create value and where you don't, and stay away from where you don't create value or leverage it. But to answer your other question, it's, it's how you present yourself and, and, uh, and the way you can convince an employer that 
you've got a, a past a set of skills, passion for what you're doing, and the ability to take the, help the organisation achieve their strategy through what they're asking for you in that role. Two. So I think it's uh, started the question with, uh, if you're keeping a focus on those fundamental skills and the continuous improvement and development of those fundamental skills, that's a big part of it. When that opportunity comes along, there, there's a demonstration of your willingness to take on that new role and, and to take the risk in going into that. You know, that's what impresses someone who's looking at it, and you have to take that chance. Uh, I think of all the job changes I made in, in my career, none were predictable. I mean, I could not have done anything like to get ready or to do this or read a different book at a different time. They came, they didn't happen that way. So that's a part of it. And, and the one time that I rejected a job uh, because I actually I was afraid I wouldn't like it and it wasn't going to be good was a big mistake. You know, that would have been a great opportunity to develop something that actually was a setback rather than an advance. And so um, I think that willingness is a big part of it. So keeping those fundamental skills on a continuously improving basis and then an openness when the time is right. And be a bit brave. Exactly. And, and be, be brave. Be brave. Be brave. To go in right, to go and demonstrate that. I'm sorry. I'll go to our third. Sorry, Karen, you want to make a comment? Yeah? I am compelled to put a plug in for IEEE. <laughs> so here's how you expand your skills beyond your core. Join a society, join one of our initiatives, stay up with technical professionals so that when you go to that employer, you say, by the way, these are other things that I do that prove that you're interested and you're up to speed, not just that you're enthusiastic about it. So participate in IEEE. Absolutely. We'll <laughs> kind of obvious. Our, we'll go to our third question over here, and then, then I'll come back to my discussion. So, right here. Uh, my name is Jonathan. I'm a current student and last year majoring in information systems and minoring in security risk management. I was wondering, what my question is, how important will it be to teach the youth about um, cybersecurity, at least the most basic function, you know, because they have a lot of, it's a lot of data to handle. What they add, what they say is all, all, always stored somewhere, more specifically to high schoolers and primary schoolers. Like when I was primary school, we never had Facebook or nothing, but yet you see children come to school with phones and for me, it's kind of crazy in myself. It's overwhelming, you know? Okay, so question is? Um, how we teach um, high, the youth cybersecurity and how to manage the data and to safeguard and protect their data so that nothing can wrong can happen to them. Okay, who wants to answer that one? So how do we take cybersecurity themes and take them down lower in uh, study levels? So moving beyond university and moving down to high school. You want to answer that one? Do a small project with them. You know, that's the best way to engage. And no matter how challenging they look at it, you'll be surprised how creative they will be. You, you know, I think there's a responsibility for parents and teachers to teach young children safe online practices, just like you teach them how to eat right and to exercise to protect their data. Um, we need to teach young people and there's somebody in the audience who's going to love this, how to be respectful online, how to t tell the kids, don't say anything online that you wouldn't say to somebody's face. So I think it's basic, almost hygiene that, that we need to teach people on, how to keep yourself safe, safe online, as well as don't get into a car with a stranger unless they have an Uber sticker. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so I want to go back to what I originally uh, asked you guys, and that was grand challenges. Often humans tend to rise to grand challenges, but it's not until we're kicked in the backside, until it's facing, until we're facing you know, real fear, uh, maybe even death, um, to really start innovating and developing. You know, World War I and World War II are terrible examples of humanity, but they also accelerated discovery, they accelerated a lot of new technologies. So for each one of you personally, what I want to hear is, and very, very briefly, because we're running out of time, the grand challenge that you foresee that humanity needs to solve and the types of skills that are going to be required. And I know engineering is at the core of that, but specifically, what sort of skills will these young people and future generations need to develop in order to tackle those challenges and solve them in the near future? And we'll start with Chris. Oh, it's easy for me. I read last weekend a great little saying, um, and it was in the context of science, and that is that I'd rather have uh, a question that I cannot answer than an answer that I cannot or that can't be questioned. And I think that um, another way to say that is groupthink. I think what's happening in uh, our communities, particularly our, 
uh, first world communities, our affluent communities is that we fall into groupthink. We talk a lot about diversity, but what's the, what's the value of having diversity of gender and diversity of, of um, religion and diversity of ethnic background if when you sit at a boardroom or you sit in a committee, you all think the same? You know, and, and my, my, the one thing that I always ask people to do is ask questions, prove that you're thinking about what's the topic. And in fact, I've even gone a stage further with an Engineers Australia recently and I'm suggesting that at some of our meetings, particularly the board <coughs> meetings and so on, there should be a nominated sceptic, a nominated um, you know, doubting Thomas, so that every time somebody says, oh yes, that's right, that's very good, or yes, someone says, why? You know, why is that a good idea? Why don't we rethink that? Why don't we have another approach? And even when things are going swimmingly well, we should question it, because as I said before, these, these black swans, these things out of left field, you know, the, the politicians that are all of a sudden aren't citizens of the country and so on, they're going to come and hit us. And so we should be asking these questions all the time. And as engineers, as scientists, we don't learn unless we ask and when we, are, when we make mistakes. Mine, mine is, my, the thing that worries me the most is uh, probably a bit more fundamental. It's uh, the current global warming. Uh, it is something that concerns me greatly and uh, I worry about my children and grandchildren. It's, it's got a consequent problem in terms of agriculture. I think the next wave of technology is going to be around agriculture. I'm sorry. Maybe a benefit. Well, it can be if engineers get off their tail and solve the problem. And, and the quest for energy, right? The global warming is caused by the quest for energy, for mobility or for, for industry. Um, it's going to have a consequent challenge around agriculture. I have great faith in that engineers who have solved all the problems of the world in the past will be able to solve this problem um, before it becomes an existential one. So that's, that's for me. Yeah. I, I think the biggest, because since I come from the research organization, the biggest problem for me is whatever we are coming with the new thinking, how we can make the money, how my company can make the money from the, there. So developing the right business model, right to make the money which is not really easy. I mean, out of 100 ideas, maybe one may click, right? So the question here is that when we think, right, we need to think actually that what is the right business model that if I start a company, how my company can make money from that idea? So I think for me, that is the biggest challenge. Uh, so for me, it is the power consumption. Uh, and I'll give you some example. Um, Many um, governments in the world put as a challenge exascale computing. And the big issue there is not putting enough computational power, but doing it within the boundaries of, I think they put 20 or 30 megawatts. Today it is about uh, 20 or 30 times more consumption. Now, uh, that has uh, motivated many companies to develop some profound technologies, such, such as non volatile memory. Uh, which has much less power consumption or photonic interconnects, including silicon photonics, which again has much less power consumption, that further enable putting much more memory and enabling algorithms which weren't possible before, because now you can uh, store many things in memory as opposed to having to go to the disk. Um, and, and that enables furthermore many new applications, not just for military, but uh, for, for many other, the Department of Energy, for example, the United States does. But it's true also in China, in Europe, and, and elsewhere. So for me, that's one of the grand challenges. Thank you. I think uh, another thought is uh, the access to technology for a much greater percentage of the world's population, uh, the chance to, to reach out. And, and you know, there's a lot of talk right now about what it's going to look like the next billion people that get on the internet the next billion people are going to be different than the first billion people that went on the internet. And you know, this is going to be a, a challenge and a real opportunity both for access to knowledge and, and growth uh, in the world. Thank you, Barry. So you may be surprised, but I'm going to talk about a military application. Okay. Um, so in, uh, in 2006 and 2007, <clears throat> I served as the chief technology officer for about a $4.5 billion organization that was trying to solve the improvised explosive device problem, the IED problem. Basically worldwide, at the time we were focused on Iraq and Afghanistan. To date, we still have not solved that problem. And that's kind of a, a gorilla that's been carrying on my back for 
for many, many years. It's, it's an incredibly complex problem that has a lot of engineering associated with it in terms of sensors, communication, data processing, image processing, those kinds of things. But it expands beyond that in terms of social network understanding, who's doing what to whom, who's financing, who's transporting. This is a problem that we faced previously, and this is a problem that we are going to face well into the future. So protecting soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines' lives, but more importantly, protecting you know, women and children in the local population. This is something that I think we, we really have to focus on. I am afraid of plastic. By the year 2050, there will be more plastic in our oceans than fish by weight. And when the fish eat the plastic, even when it's degraded to some degree, that threatens their life. When marine life is threatened, it threatens our life. So to solve this problem will require many en engineering disciplines, beginning with how do we stop creating so much plastic, and then how do we harvest it from the oceans and repurpose it in a way that isn't damaging to our environment and to ourselves. Thank you so much, Karen. And I think we've got a variety of challenges that are being faced, and maybe I'll just round it off uh, with a couple of statements. You know, energy, global warming, clean water, food security, healthcare. Many of the challenges that we face in Western societies are not the challenges that are being faced in, uh, in developing worlds. In fact, uh, Karen talks about food security from, from an ocean perspective, but also uh, how that gets into the consumption of human beings. Um, large challenges around there. But the challenges being faced in third world countries are problems that are not only the problems of that country, but the problems of the world. And uh, I think a lot of the challenges need to be addressed there first before we start to tackle some of the larger challenges as well. But interestingly enough, all of these challenges present very exciting opportunities for young people. And uh, looking at where technologies will make breakthroughs in these particular fields uh, is where you need to look for future jobs. I'll give you one example, and Karen mentioned 2050. I don't know we like to look ahead. We round numbers off. 2025 was mentioned, arbitrarily selected. Often it is arbitrarily selected, but 2050 is, is a figure that's quite often used now. And uh, by 2050, we're expected to have um, a population of about, I think, 9 or 10 or 11 billion people. Now, irrespective of the actual figure, they're predicting that we need 70% more food uh, production on the planet in order to feed the planet. Now, that is going to require some serious engineering. And we can look at it two ways. One is you put more in, you get more out. And unfortunately, the putting in part is now coming to a point of limitation where putting in is doing more damage to our planet than it is actually doing good and producing the food. So the innovations are going to come through in efficiency, how we can be more efficient in what we do. And that doesn't just include developing the latest technologies to drive uh, more production in agriculture, but it also has to do a lot with how we consume uh, logistics as well as delivery on time and so on. So what I want you to walk away with tonight is there are grand challenges that need to be solved. Young people are at the core of solving those problems. We have some very experienced uh, people who have a lot of knowledge that needs to be passed on to young people. But we're all in this together and the future of jobs, yes, there's a big question mark over that, but we've always risen to challenges and I challenge you to rise to the next challenge in life. I just want to thank again all of our panelists here for coming along and some of them flew a long way. 